Realizing the need of small and minority owned businesses to secure additional financing, in 2014, Nile Capital Group was formed. I'm Michael Real, and this is Real Urban Business. We speak with the founder and managing partner of Nile Capital Group, Melvin Lindsay. Melvin Lindsay, managing partner of Nile Capital Group. Thank you for being with Real Urban Business. When did you start this organization? First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing at Real Urban News and Real Business News. I think there's a need to have an authentic voice that represents our community, whether good or bad, uh, just focusing on the things that move us forward. Uh, I don't think the mainstream media or the business outlets really give us a, a good voice and so I appreciate the fact that you're doing it. I try to do the same thing within my business. Uh, Nile Capital Group is a private equity firm that provides capital and services to women and minority businesses and small businesses that may not be women and minority to give them an opportunity to participate in this hundred trillion dollar business of asset allocation. Um, and we believe that if there's talent, skill, um, they should be given the opportunity as other mainstream firms who've had historical relationships but may not have the necessary talent but they still get the opportunity. So we wanted to be able to have a capital source for those underserved asset allocators to be able to get that opportunity. Talk about your path, if you will, to this particular point in your professional career. Yeah, so I've had the opportunity to work for some of the top mainstream firms. I worked at Lehman Brothers prior to the demise. I worked at um, Wells Capital Group, which is the investment arm of Wells Fargo Bank. I worked for a Swiss company called um, Julius Baer. Um, and uh, I also worked for a company based out of Cape Town, South Africa called Investec and they were a leading investor in emerging markets, frontier markets and global equity markets. Um, you know, trip, typical educational background, undergrad in economics, uh, MBA in finance and also have a chart, what's called a charter financial analyst, which is a three year program um, that is really geared towards our industry if you want to do financial analysis and, and money management. Um, which, you know, credentials are part, but also having relationships is also a big part of sort of migrating, you know, uh, through this industry. We were talking off camera about relationships. How significant uh, has your relationship track been for you and uh, your particular uh, point of where you are now? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I feel like in terms of relationships, I just got really lucky. You know, over the years, I have had, it feels like guardian angels kind of helping me out through my career, whether it's, you know, saying, hey, why don't you apply for this job? Uh, we think you'd be good at this role. Uh, and for positions I wasn't seeking out myself. So, so people saw a little something in me that I had no idea I had, or they just gave me an opportunity. And I don't think everyone gets that opportunity. Um, so I feel really lucky and I felt that, you know, over the years, it was somebody that was in a position to make a decision to hire me, to give me those opportunities. And so I wanted to do the same. Uh, I recognize that I was lucky. We don't see a lot of African Americans in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. I think recently in the past, maybe, 10 years we started to learn more about persons like yourself and others. Is this a field that African Americans should be looking to move into professionally? I think so. I, I, I think that's where a lot of the um, businesses are developed and capital is allocated. So uh, in order to get capital, you know, you have to have the relationships with the people who control capital. And the more of us that are in the business, uh, the more I think we can get capital allocations. Unfortunately, for a lot of 
African Americans, when you're young and you're in school and you're you know head of the class or you're really smart, the first thing teachers or your parents tell you, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, right? Sure. Because those are the clearest path that people can think about for smart kids. They don't think about finance or entrepreneurship or technology. Uh, I think technology is becoming more popular now, uh, but that's not the typical path that people were given. And because of that, people haven't gone down the road of getting into finance. Uh, and unfortunately, since I got into business, um, and I think Maxine Waters did a very good job of sort of trying to uh, democratize the financial service business where all people can get a chance. And she was on Capitol Hill pounding the table. You know, public funds are investing in on behalf of pension funds, which are represent, you know, everyone who's working in that particular, you know, state or sector, uh, the people who are managing money should be of color to represent the same constituents that are the beneficiaries. And because of that, she did a lot of work in trying to help, you know, African Americans who have made it in finance get those allocations. My colleague Sorrell, uh, she's been working on some special projects for us, done a great job um, just learning the industry, but doing an excellent job at it and helped us design a lot of our material, doing some analysis on the industry and understanding where the money is going, the money flow from one sector to the next. And um, now we've got our working on another project of looking at one of the companies that we bought and how we helped them grow and build and uh, take their company to the next level. Talk about, if you will, briefly, the importance of teamwork. Well, it's everything. I mean, uh, for someone who ever says, I did it all on my own, is lying, right? Um, so if you build a great team and you provide transparency and for them to provide you know, feedback um, and give them a voice, they make you better. We're seeing global uh, the globalization of finance. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what are some of the emerging markets uh, that are coming online around the globe? From uh, just a power perspective, I think you know China, India, you know certain parts of Latin America are going to be big players. You know, most of our manufacturing is done in China. Um, most of I think the talent pool um, is coming from India. They have have always had a big emphasis on STEM. Um, and because of that, you know, we, India almost becomes the outsource or back office for a lot of technology companies as China was for manufacturing companies. Um, so from an emerging market, I think those two areas are going to be big players. But from an emerging, emerging sort of uh, underserved or asset class that I think people should think about is big data. Uh, there's a lot of companies like Facebook, um, even Apple, you know, Netflix, where they, where they have information about people's likes and dislikes before the analysts on Wall Street happen. And they can predict uh, consumer behavior faster than anybody. Wow. Okay. You know, I don't know how often you're, you're looking at your iPhone or your computer and, a, and an ad pops up of something you're interested in. Sure. That's by design. Right. Right. And I, and I think that opens up a huge opportunity for, uh, I think, African-Americans, for people of color, because, again, it's all about science. Okay. And I think when the race is about, race meaning like running a race, sure. is about, you know, you start from the same point and you finish at the same, we do really well. When okay. there's discretion, we don't do really well. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, science, math, technology, you know, given that it's about numbers, there's an absolute answer, um, I think we can do really well. So if we can understand big data and anticipating, you know, the emerging themes and, you know, people of color have no problem adding sort of to this economy. Sure. You know, if you think about culture and all the things that we bring, but how do you monetize all that? Right. And I think others have monetized it better than we have. Brandon, prior to sitting down with Mel, you and I were talking about the importance of what you all do. From your perspective, this is a global economy. Uh, you all have imprint all over the world. Tell us about it. Yeah, with the investments we make, 
we're helping these smaller companies build their businesses. They're very good investors, but we're really good at sales, marketing, strategy, and infrastructure and building co great companies. So our goal is to get, get great investors and help them build great companies. Sounds like a winning formula. Yeah, and, and Henry does a great job. Henry has experience on structuring deals mm -hmm. and the rest of our team really focused on you know, the sales, marketing, the back office, risk management, and portfolio management. But the one key element that we were missing is when we find a company that we want to help, how do we structure a win-win deal? And Henry has that experience and he's guided us through making sure we leave enough on the table for the team that we're acquiring. There's enough incentive for us. And so all the stakeholders, the employees, the business managers, our shareholders all uh, are aligned. One thing that uh, I find uh, fascinating about you, and I know that you're passionate about, is giving back mm -hmm. uh, to underserved communities and communities of color. How important is that to you? It goes back to my dad, who uh, unfortunately didn't graduate from college. He was born and raised in the Mississippi, segregated South. He tried to enroll. They wouldn't let him enroll. When I say they wouldn't let him, like he couldn't enroll. So. He couldn't get a job and couldn't enroll in college, so what were his options, right? His options were either do something illegal or move. So he moved to the West Coast, and his whole thought for us was that your life should be about three things, learning, earning, and returning. And he said, in your early days of your life, you should learn as much as you can. And if you do that, I'm confident that you'll earn a premium over your peers, and you should not spend all the money you make and you should not hoard all the resources that you have. You should give back. And if you do that, it's like that universal recycle sign. Sure. Stuff goes in, stuff goes out. You're basically recycling your learning and your earning by returning. And you should continue to do that. And so he just hammered that, you know, into my brothers, my sisters. We all kind of try to find ways to give back, no matter how big or how small is it church, through mentoring, through being involved in nonprofit organizations. And uh, that's the only way I think our community gets better. What's next for you in terms of your career? This yeah. is a pretty lofty uh, seat you're in now. You know, it's all relative, right? From where I sit, I don't think it's that lofty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, look, at the end of the day, we need uh, meaning our community, we need an ecosystem that works on all levels and it works for us. We need capital sources, we need, um, I think we need better policing that works for us. I think we need better education, uh, better, better health care. Uh, that's going to take a lot of capital sure. to undo some of the systematic things that have happened over the years. And so what's next for me is to try to keep running as fast as I can to contribute to those different parts of the ecosystem. And we are so far behind in terms of getting, um, I think, um, ways where we can contribute to that process uh, where it works for us. Uh, and so, you know, you just get tired of seeing it, right? And, and you know, we, we've had, um, our ancestors do certain things and make certain sacrifices. And we don't want three generations looking back now where we're at this critical inflection point and saying, you know, what happened on your watch? Sure. Right? So uh, we got a long way to go. And I think, you know, while I'm still breathing and working hard and, and doing whatever I can, is try to get the feedback from what our community tells us they need and also give some tough medicine on the sacrifices we need to make. And that's a, a, one of the big reasons why I named my company Nile Capital Group. Because when you go all through Europe, you know, you see these monuments of organ, you know, of great conquerors, great buildings, great cathedrals, great, uh, you know, churches and businesses. Uh, and then there's just very few places in Africa where you see that, right? For whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, the pyramids 
were, were some of the most um, innovative uh, things that happened in ancient times. You know, and how did they get there? And people forget that Egypt's in Africa. <laughs> they call it right. the Middle East, right? Sure, right. Um, and of course, there's been, you know, uh, changes of regimes there. But, you know, but to me, that was the source of a lot of math, technology, innovation. And I just wanted to remind myself and my team on a daily basis that we have to be somewhat contrarian. You know, the Nile River uh, runs north. Sure. You know, versus most rivers who run right. south. And, you know, given that, you know, there was a lot of innovation, there was some contrarian thinking. So sometimes you got to run against the current to really build something. Learning, earning, and returning. Melvin Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you.